specifically because I'm a trained opera singer. Do we have any requests? Wouldn't be today. <laughs> okay, we got the levels right? Thank you. So, um, thank you for inviting me here. I moved here to Cleveland from California in the summertime and I'm working on a project called the Digital City Project. And the project is about creating jobs and new kinds of jobs with the assumption that all jobs of the future will require tech skills. All right, this is probably not something new for you guys, but it's actually a big deal for the economic workforce people who still consider a job 40 hours a week, you have to go into the office. Okay? And that, of course, influences what, how we train people in jobs and education in general. So you can assume that I'm refuting the way that we train people and work and educate today. The theory here is that we're going to give away free dashboard software. Okay? Happens to be built on a platform I have called the People Aggregator. All the source code is available. Right? What I want to do is add into this software buttons next to all the key features. And the buttons say, live video help. And you click on the button and a human comes up and you help them. All right? And what we're going to do is uh, use social media software to create a virtuous circle of training and volunteerism. To invite people in, both to be trainees and to be volunteers, and participate in a community that's uh, changing the world. And this will all be open source and given away for free. So I'm going to walk you through this virtuous circle process and then talk to you about this project, of which I'm hoping that over the next five years, we can create 5,000 jobs. And that's why I moved here. And this is actually uh, a PhD I'm working on. Right? So the theory here is that you invite people in and you show them how to join the system. And imagine this being in a community center or down the street or with a portable laptop, whatever. And believe it or not, many times you have to tell people, do you know that you could read off the screen? Right? And we point out that you don't need to read a manual. And you can just click around and discover, among other things, the live video help button. So you click that button, and up comes somebody that starts to explain to you the notion of community, online community, where you can create friends, and join groups, and leave comments. And when you do that, we're then also going to hit you up and say, look, we're giving you a lot of stuff for free. Would you like to volunteer back? And all the software will all be associated with individual local community nodes, physical places, digital bureaus, where these machines will be available, where trainees will be there, where the video help people are, where live events are stored. And that someone from each node will upload and fill in what particular volunteer tasks and things they need done in that community right now. And when someone volunteers to help, they get points. And the trick here is how to connect the online world, the cyber world, with the real world. And whenever you can connect those two worlds, the cyberspace and meat space, right when they come together, that traction creates the magic. So what we're going to do is we're going to award points for blogging, for making friends, for uploading media, for leaving comments. You get points, just like you get points for going down the street fair or the senior citizen's home or uh, this, uh, bake sale. Okay? Now you would ask, why do I want points? Well, all you gamers know why you want points, because you can get your name up on the leaderboard. Right? And imagine that applied to society and to job training and to working way up to the community, where these points actually meant something, and we're encouraging you to contribute to the community. Right? Now, when I was teaching my class uh, uh, at Case, and I explained to my students that we would award points, what do you think the students immediately thought? Oh. I can hack into the system and get some more points. Right? So progressing through this virtuous circle process is not just about the points. It's also about the relationship that you establish with the manager, the person who's running the program in that particular center. And the combination of the points in that relationship creates this process to enable someone to go through this circle. And we're more or less vetting out people. Of 1,000 people who came to the system, to the, to the digital bureau, you know, maybe only 100 or 200 will make it all the way through the process. But when they make it through the process, they're going to get paid. They're going to get a job. All right? So the magic moment when you complete the first circle and you've come around and you're really getting ready to start kicking ass, it's that red pill moment where Neo is asked, the red pill or the blue pill? Right? It's the moment where you realize why Twitter and Facebook never advertise. 
the moment where you say, I'm having such a good time, you invite in your friends. Right? So once you've done that and you've admitted that you really are part of this community and you like it and you want to invite other people in, then we start to tell you about the fact that 1% of the world creates, 9% of the world rate, comment, engage in some other way, follow, and then 90% just look at the thing. And that's the reality of how this cyber technology affects normal people. So now we've gotten them into the system, we're going to show them how to comment and rate and, and blog, and now the next time they think of something, rather than just join a group, maybe they'll create their own group. Instead of just leaving a comment on a blog post, maybe they'll create their own blog post, right? You see how we're getting them in, and using social media as a vehicle to get them involved with, guess what, now volunteering. So now, instead of asking them to go and set up the chairs in the tent for the street fair, now we're going to ask them to actually be the person in the, demo, in the booth that's demoing. Instead of just going to the senior citizen home and setting up the lights, now they get to be the person that's doing the interviewing, right? Because this job bureau, this digital bureau, will be involved in actually producing multimedia and to producing events and to using cyber technology out in the community to create benefits for people, okay? So we work our way through the system, and now I get to tell you about myself. I'm here, I moved here, I'm a catalyst, I'm hoping to create change, I'm hoping to recruit you all to help change the world. So I've got a class here, it's been open to the community, you can come, uh, it's called IAME 371. Um, uh, we're building an open platform. I've got source code available if you're into it. Okay? And the trick here of this project is to combine three different efforts. Think of them as three different ecosystems. It's my past life, which is the world of multimedia. It's my present life, I've been a geek in social media and like open standards. And it's this future world of creating new jobs. So imagine combining those three things together. So, a case, they have this thing called the Research Showcase. Have you ever heard of that? This is actually the poster I was showing two days ago at the, at the showcase, which shows this research and all the things I'm doing to get this PhD, right? So over here is this Digital C platform. Here's the notion of multimedia content. And here is the notion of jobs. So I think I'll tell you about it. So I'll just pretend like you're some PhD student and I have to do it like in three minutes. Hi, how are you doing? Yes, this is my research. We're going to create a virtuous circle process to create jobs, new kind of jobs, okay? And from this sustainable model that we're going to create, we're actually going to pay the workers to learn their job skills, right? Now the secret where the money is, is multimedia, right? Is the notion of upgrading the Wikipedia from a static thing, which is text with a photo, to a dynamic multimedia. And if you think about Wikipedia, there's like over three million entries in Wikipedia. And if you go to a screen that's like about a battle, wouldn't you expect to see movement of the troops over a few days period of time? And if you wanted to go learn about how to install a window or fix something, wouldn't you expect to see a, a diagram of that object? It zooms up, you double click, a video starts to show you how to fix it. And if you were researching and thinking about polymers or some sort of scientific, scientific information, wouldn't you want to see the molecules forming and zooming out and splattering and explaining and visualizing this, the phenomena that is this information? That's what we mean by a multimedia encyclopedia, right? It's going to take like a trillion dollars to upgrade the text-based multimedia that we have in Wikipedia, where they took the Encyclopedia Britannica and we put it online, right? We used to call that the bricks and mortar stuff, right? But if you think about how much animation, video, and, 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 and web pages, and information architecture, and all the things that have to be done over the next 25, 30 years, that's going to cost a lot of money. Now, if they're not going to pay for the New York Times, and you're not going to pay for music or music, who's, music or movies, who's going to pay for all this multimedia? Well, the secret is happening in downtown Cleveland right now with PNC taking over National City. See, PNC has a budget of about $100 million to rebrand itself. And currently, they put their money into billboard ads, signage, whatever. But we know that the entire world of marketing is moving online. And they're trying to figure out how to best put that money to usage. And instead of doing this rebranding effort that after one or two years, you know, the, the, the billboard ads are done, and okay, you got the signage up, and you know, that's the traditional way to market, we're going to pitch these folks and look, why don't you give us some money, you'll pay for this multimedia content. At the same time, the people who get hired to produce that multimedia will agree to train and educate workers 
in those same job skills. And then the output of that multimedia content goes on to open shared servers that have APIs on them. So we can then build other apps and services on top of that. So I like to use polymers as an example. I also like to use rock and roll as an example. So PNC hooks up with the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. We produce the history of the blues. We hire workers to produce these videos. Now we've got an open data server of the history of the blues. APIs can access it and use it. So to understand the techie geeky stuff, um, I coined this phrase a while ago called digital lifestyle aggregation. It's the notion of dashboards and having an integrated environment that's highly customizable that aggregates people, services, and content. So from the notion of digital lifestyle aggregation, I'm propounding that we want to continue to provide personalized dashboards. It might look a lot like iGoogle or NetVibes, or really your Facebook page. It doesn't matter. The idea is that you have a place that's your own place. And it, has, and it supports open standards. It allows you to mesh into the rest of the web. Now at the same time, I believe that government will start giving out dashboards. And I think they'll call them citizen dashboards. You'll plug in your social security number and your zip code, and we'll come back at you as all this information that's relevant, right? And it creates this new, what I call software infrastructure, right? So I'm going to talk about in a second more details of what that means. But the, the, uh, what, what I've been studying and working on, and we can go off and raise your hand, and we can dive in at any level, are these new kind of containers that are embedded, they're, they're micro tags, that are embedded into dashboard pages that can enable distributed architecture. So we can talk about that in distributed friending, or we can talk about these new kind of shared servers that will be new kind of municipal servers that we'll all sit on top of, which then creates a open platform. But first, we've got to innovate workforce development. You know that every government, federal, county, state, city, all the way down, all pour billions of dollars into workforce development. And the trick here is to come up with a sustainable model that we're not dependent upon government, where we can by cranking out multimedia and doing all these commercial efforts, we can use that money to train workers and to build our open platform, right? And this is where, the, again, this, this theme of connecting the online world to the real world and learning by doing is key, right? And it turns out that you can't just put up software. It just doesn't miraculously build a community. You really need human facilitation. Hopefully everybody, oh, let's put it this way. Who disagrees with me on that one? All right, you need humans. All right, good. All right, and then the humans work with the social media, right? We connect the haves to the have-nots, right? We create the sustainable business model, the three-for-one model that drives it, and we create jobs. What kind of jobs are you talking about? Well, I believe that all jobs will require tech skills. See, we all take for granted these tools called the technology. But most people don't see that a computer is just a new kind of hammer or screwdriver. Right? And that's something we've got to train them and educate them on. So all these traditional jobs are actually going to get affected. And what the one trick to do is, instead of trying to come in the front door and knock on the door and say, hi, I'd like to bring cyber social media to your company, how about if we like kind of parachute in these saboteurs, these people working behind the scenes, these people that we pay their salary, and we just kind of give enterprise free work, free help, free social media. Don't ask them for money up front. Show them the benefits and the power of, in the HR department, in the marketing department, in the sales department. Show them why you can take social media and put it to use. And then when the six-month internship runs out, then you say, OK, would you like to employ this person or not? Because in fact, if it works out well, they will not let that person leave. They will then hire that person. Right? The other kind of jobs we're talking about are independence. People aren't attached to a particular company. Right? Again, very obvious to you all, this is radical stuff to the economist, believe it or not. And then lots of new kind of startups will be born, including one called Digital Mechanics, which is the company I'm going to start. And it's going to be a new kind of system integrator. And it's going to run this digital city. It's going to run these training programs. It's going to produce events. It's going to make sure this is all going to happen. And when it's all happening, it's five years from now, Nancy Pelosi comes in. And we've created 5,000 jobs. Nancy Pelosi is going to take credit, right? And then all the source code's available. So everyone around the world is going to start downloading the source code. And they're going to call us up and say, hey, Mark, um, our digital city doesn't look as good as Cleveland. And then they're going to hire us, and we're going to fly to Singapore or whatever and make some money, right? Now, the trick here in these open platforms is how to mesh in with others. 
You see, in the 80s, it was Apple versus Microsoft. In the 90s, it was Microsoft versus Netscape, right? In this past decade, we've got Google, Facebook, all these major players, right? But where's the room for us? How do we interconnect together? That's where the open standards come in and an open platform, a distributed world of the future, right? So to give you an idea of the, the real problem here, I don't believe this is an economic challenge. The real problem here is a fear. The digital divide is not economic. Digital divide has to do with people who are afraid of computers, right? So the first thing you have to do is overcome that by getting nice warm and fuzzies as they are introduced to the power of the community. <laughs> you know, it's like, eh, I'm an ex-auto worker, what does this have to do with me? So you have to show them, you have to put your hand on the mouse with them, you gotta get their kids to guilt them out. And once you're there in this environment, you wanna act, allow them to acclimate themselves. So imagine when you hit one of those, help, I need help, up comes a screen of a bunch of operators, and you click, and that person comes up and walks you through whatever problem you have. Um, interesting side note, my wife is in California right now on the project, and they've got these pre-canned, they call them avatars, these little pre-canned little video talking heads, explaining and giving answers to standard questions. So the thing about video help is that it's nice and custom, but it doesn't scale when you get thousands and then tens of thousands of questions. So in fact, you create a pyramid and the standard FAQ stuff, you have pre-canned with the talking head. And then as the questions get more and more unique, you can then feed the questions to live operators. Okay, so the next thing is to participate. I can't tell you how many times I've set up and built social networks where everyone signs up and they don't do anything with it. By the way, do you know, uh, this is a prescient moment in the history of social networking. You all know what got announced yesterday. Ning is no longer going to give free networks. You must pay to be on Ning. Okay. FYI. Timestamp. So the trick here is that if we can make these volunteer tasks and things that are going on in your real world community, tie that into the online community, that'll constantly give ways for people to participate and be involved. And then the key thing about choice, and why I always like to use the Matrix and uh, Neo, is that you know, in the second movie when at the end was with the architect, you know? And it says, choice. That's what makes us humans, right? And the essence of a customizable, customizable environment, that you're building it to what, how you want it to be. That's what my Yahoo was. That's what NetVibes is, iGoogle. Facebook, they don't really allow you to customize too much, right? But MySpace kind of got its cred on that, right? Now, I'm imagining that uh, one of the problems with workforce development, like I'm heavily into multimedia and I'm going to get people to do all these multimedia jobs, but the problem is, is that only about 10% of the populace are ever going to get those kind of jobs. And there's all these other sales and marketing and office stuff and other kinds of work. And so we have to have a system that can make sure to cover a wide range of job skills. So the other thing we're going to ask our volunteers to do, besides be a real-time video help operator, is to mentor. And so you imagine I have a board here where people would list their expertise and how many people they can handle at the same time, sort of like their inventory. And when they're all booked up and they've got enough people, they gray out, they continue to mentor. When they graduate or somebody, then they would turn back on with more inventory available, okay? But the other kind of choice that I'm hoping people understand is, again, let's go back to this ex-auto worker. And he, out, he actually helped build the 1972 Corvette. So he's joined the 1972 Corvette group, right? But then his buddy comes on and says, wait a minute, the 69 Corvette was much better. So he creates his own group. See, we're trying to encourage these folks to realize that they don't have to just go with the pre-canned stuff. They can build their own experience, right? So the trick here is to create these new kind of hybrid jobs, to study it over a five-year period of time, to actually quantify and to create empirical data that proves that this theory can work, right? Uh, quickly about myself, I started a company called Macromind. That became Macromedia. And what kind of wigged me out was that like this address says that this is before I moved to California when I still lived in Chicago. And I was asking about, let's build a multimedia encyclopedia. That's 22 years ago. So how weird is that? It's like here I am in Cleveland and I want to build a multimedia encyclopedia. It's kind of cool. Okay? So I did this, all this stuff, and we had this revolution. And we were, you know, because remember when we started, it was a black screen with a little green stripe along the bottom. So it was a big deal to say, 
and in the future, you'll have photos and videos. And one time we did this, like, right after the Loma Prieta earthquake, we had this simulated newspaper of the future, and we showed animations and videos in the newspaper, and then there would be this blue word, and we would underline it, and we'd say, and in the future, you'll be able to click on a word and find out what it means, right? And so this is all kind of mocked up stuff in the 80s, right? So along come the 90s and all these CD-ROMs were produced and everything's rocking out, 25,000 CD-ROMs. And then the web came along and everything ground to a halt, right? Because you couldn't suck enough data up or spit it out fast enough to be a photo or a video, right? So 15 years later, we're back to where we came from. And as I was saying earlier, this notion of Wikipedia, if you could take that and run with it, and instead of being centralized and all in one place, you can imagine busting that open and have a distributed, decentralized kind of environment. So let's say if Chevron wants to pay for some wacky polymer stuff and it's, it's all happening, but maybe they twist it and turn it in their good corporate way, well then DuPont can come along and twist it and turn it in their way. You know, Monsanto or Pioneer do their genetic farming this way, and somebody can come along and do it that way. That's called the free marketplace. Right? It's just money. So again, we're going to build out these multimedia encyclopedias. That creates all these jobs. And in fact, one of the first things that people ask me, pause for water, what is a digital city? In the 90s, by having Wi-Fi or internet access, bam, that was enough. Right? That's what a digital city meant. Wow, I can get internet access. That was the falling water in the box. In the past decade, I go up to someone and say, hi, how you doing? Let's meet on Facebook. Hi, here's my email. We can talk about what we saw on Hulu last night. Right? We've got all this stuff here. We, we assume that we have internet in our hand. Right? We assume that it's a camera that's an MP3 player. We assume that I can buy my shoes through Zappos. Why would you go to a, a store? This is the world we're in today. This is our infrastructure. This is what we assume we're going to have. So now let's assume, or think about where does software infrastructure go next. All right? So here's where the notion of a digital city platform comes in. It has to be a level playing field. Because when government steps in and they're handing out a citizen dashboard, so what does Google do? What does Facebook do? What does NetVibes do? We reunite around open standards to connect them all together. Right? And the thing is that they all understand is commerce and driving jobs and making money. As long as that's happening, they can't say no. We can do anything we want with our open platforms. All right? We can even allow the teabaggers in. So let's understand what we mean by infrastructure here. This is what people pretty much call infrastructure today. I'm talking about creating so-called middleware application services, mashups, all these kind of things which then lead to new kinds of solutions. So if I had this digital city account and I drove down to Akron, I'd bring with me my Collinwood interface into Akron, I'd tie into my brothers in Youngstown and Lorraine, and we're working on the chocolate reggae thingy. Right? Doesn't matter what it is. Now imagine a activity stream, this notion of this digital city, this digital region, where the Oberlin team has upgraded something on the Underground Railroad. The local cafe is putting up their daily things. Some marketing gals put up something. Another book club had something else. And we're all shared on this community activity stream. Right? Again, connecting the real world and the cyber world together. Here's another notion of a shared timeline. So we know that all these cameras are out there. But a surveillance camera is the ultimate dead, flat webcam kind of thing. So imagine for each of our nodes, our, we, had, we were editorializing the cameras. So between 6 and 8 in the morning, it was like the flower market or the fish market. Between 8 and 10, it was the rush hour cans. At lunchtime, it was East 4th Street, where the lunch scene is. All right, at uh, 3.30, the kids playing in the playground. Uh, sunset cam, night, nightclub scene, right? And we constantly rotate and editorialize those cameras. Now we click on one of the camera images. We go to a page that's dedicated to that intersection where that camera is. Here are the other cameras. Here are the people who live nearby. It's all that geolocal stuff tied in with our open infrastructure. It's on open servers and open APIs. So any developer can come along and build on top of that. Right? So let me kind of walk you through what I imagine to be the infrastructure of a digital city. Key thing is going to be a federated ID. Do I have to explain what that means? Single sign-on? 
So imagine if I use my Case Western ID and I can log into the uh, Cleveland Clinic. I can go onto the library system. I can pay my fines and dues. I can do all these different things based upon the notion of a federated digital city ID. Right? These surveillance cameras I just talked about are all over the city, and there's all these bureaus, and each bureau has these help operators in them. We stage our live events, we do training, we got physical boots on the ground in that neighborhood. Right? Now we gotta connect in, as much as they're Babylon and the old school, we gotta connect into that, that, older, that other world. The banks, government, educational institutions, right? And business, this is all about business and money. Remember, if you can just acknowledge that money drives this whole engine, then we're gonna create new kinds of business directories. I could send my media people up and down uh, Coventry and 185th Street and Detroit Avenue. And they take their video cameras in and they videotape these people. And it's not just store owners, it can be electricians and carpenters and local people. And we use our video and our media to produce a multimedia business directory. And what does the electrician do? He's gonna show you his work. You're gonna get testimonials from happy customers. We give him this whole thing for free, we wrap it up, it's in his digital, uh, his resume, and it helps him get work. We're putting the media to use. This is all off the shelf stuff, right? Content is still king. The whole thing is driven by content. So if I can be interviewing senior citizens, if I can go talk about the history of polymers, or the Underground Railroad, or green jobs, or I can talk about how to use, uh, check your blood and for diabetes, this is all content that's gonna happen. There's money there to pay for it. The trick here is that they all need us. They need the media geeks and the people to put the stuff up into the cloud. Because once it goes up to the cloud, it's there forever. Let's not forget urban farming and urban gardening and health services and servers filled with jobs and events. My favorite one is actually a timeline server. So I went to a digital city summit in Amsterdam and they were actually building one of these things. So now imagine we've gone and we've uh, uh, transcribed our interviews of our senior citizens, and we tag it with dates where they mention dates in their discussion, 1933, 1957, 1964. We then create an open timeline server that goes, and whenever I double click, it puts up an interface, double click on 1933, double click on January, up comes all the interview segments that talked about January 1933. Then we go to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, the Cleveland Symphony, the Cleveland Art, and we put up timelines, uh, chronological sequences of content, of media. We mesh the whole thing together. And it's all available on a shared open server. Right? That's what I'm talking about, these municipal servers. Cloud services, blah, blah, blah. So we'll build these digital bureaus. It turns out they cost about 75 grand a pop per month. We have 20 employees, eight of them, uh, 12 of them are interns. So once you work your way through that virtual circle, there's a Pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, a job, <laughs> right? So you work your way up, you get a job, boom, and we place you out in the real world with these multimedia projects. And this has to be an alliance. This has to be working with others. There's a lot of well-intentioned people here. What they don't know is about LAMP. I go to the head of the computer science department at Case. I say, what sort of LAMP do you have? And she says, what's LAMP? Right, so understand the way the world is out there. And the knowledge and information and expertise that you guys have can help change the world. Okay? So I'm here doing baby steps. Let me quickly tell you about all these different things we got going. And please ask questions. Okay. So do you know that Case is putting fiber optic connectivity into every house and apartment on Hessler Street? It's called the Case Connection Zone. My class, the IIME 3 so, Question? Yeah, Hessler Street like, is literally right in the middle of Case. It's like right behind the Mandel School, right off of four, it's like right smack there. There's the switches are right in the Mandel School, and literally the glass just goes out the back door and up on some telephone poles. No, no, it's, uh, it's a case, right? At uh, 110th, about 110th in Euclid. Yeah, it's very cool. Where Mayfield hits uh, Euclid. Um, now, my class that I'm teaching is providing a dashboard for that environment, all right? And next fall, when we continue to teach it, it's an open class, and so if you can come and join and participate, right? Now, it's officially a research project. Like, what would one do with one gigabit into each home and apartment? <laughs> so if you've got reasons, figure out ways to use that, we'll test it, okay? Uh, the next is an effort coming out of the engineering school called the Idea Institute. 
this is an entrepreneurial activity thing. Uh, literally, they said to me, Mark, how come Case is it more like MIT or Stanford? Right? People go to MIT or Stanford to start companies. Right? Bill Gates, Mark Zuckerberg, Yahoo, Google, they went and they came out of schools. How come people don't do that at, at Case? So we're trying to change that. We're going to create ways to support people, to create companies. There's a little incubator called GCA, Goldstein, Caldwell and Associates. They're at about 106th and Carnegie. It's the old Brunswick Floral Building, so that's an incubator. We're going to be uh, working with other incubators, teaching classes, brainstorming, unconferences, anything uh, kind of activities we can do to help entrepreneurs start companies. Um, the other thing, which, and don't tell me about this one, I'll have to kill you. Uh, hopefully next week announce uh, the Civic Commons, which will be a new kind of blah, blah, blah. It's heavy duty, okay? You can just say you heard it here first. Uh, and I'm also doing a network for East Cleveland. And I'm applying for grants and building relationships and helping out wherever I can. G Network stands for my buddy George Nemeth, who's starting a network of networks. Thank you. So I, I moved here to do this. Question. Ah. Pulled it right out of my ass. It's a big number. It's bigger than one and not as big as ten. I actually said that I actually have this model. Here's the, the way the model works. It's called the epsilon factor, by the way. Okay? Number, of net, number of bureaus, 20 employees per bureau at any one time, 12 of them are interns. You flip the interns four times a year. X number become employees, they come back in. X number go independent, X number go startup. In that ecosystem, these other kind of jobs are started per bureau, multiply. Uh, to get to 5,000, I got 15 bureaus going. Each bureau costs 75,000 bucks a month. It was added up, dude. Oh, and there's interesting things like the city um, job people. Well, if you go to the city job people and vet and sit in line and go through their stupid forms, your name goes on a list. That if we take those people and train them, we get 1,500 bucks a pop. And those people go through that, then when they get a job, they'll pay for 50% of their salary for six months. God bless America, right? But the thing is that all this money is being wasted right now. $540 million a year was spent on job training last year. So I actually fall into a category called job training. Fine, I'll take some of that money, because it'll help pay for the whole thing. We also have to pay for those embedded people that we parachute in. <laughs> so you add all that money up. And then you say, okay, well, how much money do I need to never run out of cash? And that's what I asked for the Cleveland Foundation and the government. Right? So it turns out that I was given a number. It was like, for every $10 million, you should generate 300 jobs. So I'm actually at like $10 million generating 1,000 jobs. That was, so that was the litmus I had. Right? Question. Mm -hmm. And those are called incubators. So are you familiar with what's going on now with incubators? There's one called Tech Columbus, which is in Columbus. There's one called the Youngstown Business Incubator, Youngstown. Um, I think the Jumpstart people think that they're an incubator. They really aren't. Um, there's a small little one in Shaker Square called Hatch. Um, the famous ones are one in Boston called Y Combinator, Paul Graham. So people are trying to do that, you know. And we've been already had some business plan contests and open pitch day and stuff, so we're inviting people in to come and, and pitch. So like at the, at the research showcase thing, there were 500 people with posters, right? And the guy next to me, he had a sensor for sand. Right? It's like this really esoteric thing, but you know, has a small little market. See, the, the misnomer about entrepreneurism that it requires venture capital, and that's just so not true. Only like less than 1% of companies get venture capital. Like all these other companies are founded that, you know. So this guy is standing next to me. I'm asking, so dude, do you want, like what do you do? He actually won an award, he got a little ribbon, right? And so, okay, so what are you going to do? And he, you were there, right? He was the guy next to me. And 
He says, yeah, I want to start a company so I can productize my technology. Right on. So the Idea Institute would help him do that. So this is where they're putting the carpet for the horse. Entrepreneurism is not about the fact that I've got some buildings, you know. Dude, do you want to see some because you just came in? All right. I'm going to bring something up just to blow your mind. And you, and you can feel bad that you missed it and all that, you know. No, it's not about capital. I could, call, I could say it's about human capital. This is not about that kind of money. This is money the other way. This is like, let's use this money efficiently to, here, so just read that. Look at that for a while. So, so this is about, first of all, part of this chart shows that half the money goes that way. Half the money is actually used to pay the intern. Because then that creates this kind of vicious whipping motion, right? And so as you work your way up to the system, you could eventually be one of these help operators. Ideally, you'd be training the people below you, right? And then out of that comes all sorts of jobs and opportunities and training. Because the problem with the real problem with job workforce training is that they give you like one or two jobs and you've got to fit into their box. And the power of the technology allows you to design your job to your lifestyle and what you want to be doing. That's what they hate. And that, none of that makes it onto the numbers, into the books. All this is off grid, you know? So if we can get enough people going to show, look, this is where jobs are of the future, right? So that's this, and so my particular shtick is I want to be this new kind of system integrator, right? My existing company's got the technology. That's just one particular kind of social networking platform. You can do this stuff with anything. I just happen to have one, you know? I'm not the only portal on Hessler Street. I'm just the first. It's all about open APIs, which creates new jobs, which leads to the sustainable engine. Let me recap for you dudes who just came in. Here's the idea. We're going to create so much multimedia content. We're going to be producing a trillion dollars worth of multimedia content over the next 25 to 30 years. I'm talking about turning and visualizing everything. Okay? Now all that, what we want to do is we want to pitch sponsors. So it might be PNC who have a budget because they're, upload, they're upgrading National City and they've got a budget. It might be focus on the polymer industry. Can someone tell me what the number one and number two industries are in Ohio today? Agriculture and polymers. Agriculture is 91 billion. Polymers are 89 billion. They're counting all of Procter & Gamble as a polymer company. There's a place down in Akron called the Goodyear Polymer Center, right? I'm standing out in front of this building. There's this beautiful Tichuli sculpture. It's a $100 million building, 50 PhDs, 1,500 patents. You go on their website, nada, niente, nothing. So we go to these guys, and in fact, it's a joint venture between Case and the University of Akron. We're calling it Polymer Valley. It's not the only thing they've got going, but I want to get them to produce polymer multimedia encyclopedias, go to the Ohio Polymer Association, which then we all go to Procter & Gamble or Chevron or Monsanto, and we say, give us money. But we're going to use this money three for, well, three for one. We're going to use it to produce the content. But when we're producing the content, we're training workers in those job skills necessary to learn how to produce the content. Right? And then we're going to take that content, put it onto shared open servers with APIs on it. Now that works any place, because every city has an industry they have workers that need jobs. They, have, they need the software infrastructure. This is the future. Everybody wants to be a digital city with digital citizens with digital jobs. So once they show that this is working, now the problem is you can go to the bookstore and get 100 books on the future of jobs, right? But none of them have quantitative and qualitative analysis that creates empirical data that proves this works. So the trick here is that I go get this PhD, and we study this for five years. And we show that we can create, as a random number, $5,000. Might be $3,000, might be $10,000, we'll see. <laughs> That's the goal, wouldn't $5,000 work? See, this project doesn't work in New York or LA, because there's too much economic activity. Well, here, it's got this really nice flat line. <laughs> that is basically going down, right? So you create a little blip. Oh my god, there's a blip. 
Nancy Pelosi flies in, takes credit. And so then we don't, we, people download the source code all around the world. And they call us up and say, Mark, can you come and fly into Singapore? And another billion dollar company is born. And I call that billion dollar company Digital City Mechanics. Question. Yes. When they run an ad right now, it's a complete image piece. There's this notion called Intel Inside, or BP talks about how we're diversifying out of oil. Nobody cares what BP's doing. They're making so many billions of dollars, they almost have to run those ads just so they don't look like they're completely, you know, their margins go from 80 to 79%. They're like, oh look, we're spending money, educated. It's all a game, right? I and mean, we know that Monsanto is evil. We know that the oil industry is putting pollutants into our air. We want to guilt them out. We want to get some of that money and put it into something that's going to be put to good use. We're going to be a 501c3. They're going to be able to write this off. <laughs> Look, you're creating jobs, you're creating content, all the content gets your name on it, it goes into the cloud, it's there forever. Oh, you ever heard of the future? How about software infrastructure? If that's not sexy enough for you, I don't know what is. And we convince them. Now, the first three or five are the hardest. But I'm a guy that's been there that you have to have compunction and just wait there and just pound. Today we got 20 people in the room. Next year we'll have 200, next year we'll have 2,000. Just the way the game works. You want to know what it was like in 1985 to pitch multimedia? They put me onto the software panel. We like this accountant guy and a guy doing printer drivers and me. And I would show animation and say, in the future we'll have video and animation and you'll click and you'll, you know, what the fuck is he talking about? But a few people would grok it, and they'd come over to the side of the stage, and they, they'd get my card, and they'd learn about it. And over and over again, I meet people who told me that my product helped create their career. So it's just a matter of time. It's not a matter of if, but when. I mean, to say a statement like, all jobs of the future will require tech skills, I don't have to convince you of that. That's really radical to these people. But where does the forklift operator No, I'm confused. Does it mean it's a remote control forklift? I mean, that's the way they think. We still teach our children by walking them out of the classroom, going down the hallway, and they go into a room called the computer room. They learn computers. They go back into the classroom, and they're handed pieces of paper. So the greatest barriers we have, I said earlier, I love this slide, I'll repeat it, I apologize. The, economic, uh, the digital divide is not economic. It's fear. It's fear of the computer, because they, they, they don't know about it. It's something new. So it's these teachers, these, these nurses, these doctors, these people who let somebody else answer their email for them. They have jobs that do that. People do that. There's a guy in D.C. who tutors senators and congressmen how to use their BlackBerry because the congressman is too embarrassed to ask their assistant to show them how to use it. So they have to go in secret to learn how to use it. This is the world we're in. These are the people who set our policy, who are spending billions of dollars in workforce development every year. So the way they parse this is new form of economic development, new kind of training. Okay, here's some money. But wait a minute, I didn't understand that this buy, is, is that copyrighted? Buy, what are you giving away for free? So the, oh, that's called marketing dollars. I see that Monsanto logo on it. Oh, it's a PNC sponsor. Who the fuck cares? I mean, what do you think the first thing the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame says? Because what you miss is that I was pitching that, well, let's go pay for the history of the blues. It's another project. They're all gonna think about copyright and how to make money off of it. Right? So I chose the blues on purpose because Robert Johnson starts like a dun, 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 and then Jimmy Reed starts a dun, 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 and Chuck Berry goes dun, 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 right? And they take the same thing and that's public domain. And we can show how through open, the spread of open ideas, the culture yeah, moves. It's creative commons. Share alike. That's how I do it. So it means that some things are hands off. The Western Reserve only recently, uh, when I first came to town, I pitched the Western Reserve Historical Society. They told me, well, how much money will you pay us to get access to our content? Literally, it, yeah. Only the past two months, his uh, case, the library started to do, digitize some of their data. I mean, this is, takes many years. There will be 100 people, maybe 1,500, uh, uh, two to 300 people in this town digitizing content as a job. 
Because there's so much shit in those libraries and those museums. It'll take years and years just to do that. You'll pay for your kids to go to college because you were digitizing books. And that's a job of the future. Question? All right, well, so I don't know what time it is. I can keep talking. Another question? Oh, in the back. Thank you. And I do take requests, so trained opportunity, a little Gilbert and Sullivan. Uh, yes? That's the social network. The company was called Broadband Mechanics. It's open source available at update.peopleaggregator.org. Only one caveat. If you're a capitalistic bastard, you're going to have to pay me some money. Right? But if you're going to use it for op open, nonprofit, government, Startup, no startups, no students. Dude, when you make some money, I named my own license. It's called Pay As You Go. If you make some money, update.peopleaggregator.org. Okay. Um, you know, mm -hmm. Okay. Question. So the way this works, the sequence is, is that, and I'll give you two examples, Akron and Cleveland, okay? So Akron, there are very few of those people. So just the Polymer Project will probably use up, shall I say, fill up the inventory of all the professionals. And when we hire the professionals, their deal is that they have to go and train. But up here in this region, there's 10 times as many, maybe even 20 or 30 times as many. So we can't go all, question? Okay, we can't go hire all the video editors for just the history of the rock and roll, right? Okay, so you got to start somewhere. We build it more and more. Dude, my budget is, ca is calling for millions of dollars, five, tens of millions of dollars per year in production work. When I first came to town, I gave a presentation at Thunder Tech, you know, and they looked at me like I was there to take their work from them, because you know, it's this small little pie here, and everyone's fighting over the little bit of work. And I'm here to say, dude, we're going to make this pie 100 times bigger. This is going to be work for everybody if this works out. I can't apply until I get my PI thing together. I'm just filling out my, P, my PhD stuff to get that whole game in order. Playing the game, baby. Jumping through the hoops. Now you got your question? Yeah. Uh, but let, me, let him finish first. Go ahead. Right. So when I first came to town, I wanted to be both a 501c3 and a for-profit. That confused the hell out of people. And I'm scaring them enough with the ideas, with the shirt, with the body language. So they said, Mark, please. And I said, you know what? Fine. I won't be a 501c3, but you know what I'll do? I'll partner with Case. So currently that's how I'm doing it. I'm going to have my own 501c3, dude. But you've got to play the game. You've got to listen. These people, I've been told it's okay to call them parochial. They think of themselves as parochial. They wear it on their chest. They're proud of being parochial. How do you, that's why this is the perfect environment. Because if you can educate and turn a parochial town like Cleveland into a digital city, you can fucking do it anywhere. Right? Question. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Are you familiar with those social media aggregators? There are products that do that. From one thing over and another yeah, thing. Right. right. I can't share lots of posts on my live journal with friends. Absolutely. Friends. Now, a little FYI. So I've been trying to work on that for five, seven, eight years. I wrote a book in that, okay, how to do that. Those containers I pointed to is how to do that to do distributed friending, okay? So I got a tech, and I was actually trying, I had my class last semester working on implementing that, and I could go on to that for a second, but let me give a more quickie answer. So the social media aggregator strategy is the way to go. So expect that guy, people aggregator, to be all about your Facebook account and your LinkedIn account and your Flickr account, and, okay? That's the first thing. But understand, I'm going to a whole generation of people who don't know what the fuck that is, 
Second of all, always support the open standards, right? So be prepared. Facebook's going to announce the next, next turn of the crank. Facebook is a, is a weird dichotomy because on one side, it's a closed platform. And the other side, it's kind of pushing the envelope of openness. The other thing to understand about this, these things are not mutually exclusive. Yes, Facebook is battling against MySpace and Bebo and LinkedIn. But those are broad swath horizontal networks. So those people who are into the broad swath, that's beautiful. But you're still into chocolate or reggae or, let's see, what do you got? Turquoise and green hair. And he's got a social network of just turquoise and green hair guys. That's called the vertical niche thing. So it's the intersection of the vertical and the horizontal. That's the reality of the future. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. I can tell you how it's going to happen. So do you know the name Toby Cosgrove? He's the CEO of the clinic. All right. Now we got this thing going on right now at Case. And as of May 23rd, come to the Hester Street Fair. We're going to have a digital ribbon cutting ceremony. Okay. And it's, people at Gate will be the gateway in. And you're going to be asked to sign and log in. And then they're going to tell you, sorry, you don't live in Hester Street. You can't be part of our research. Now, I've tried to explain to them that while their research is going on, we can have an open network on the outside, right? So they've got this firewall set up. But the way these people think, they don't grok this stuff until they're already there, right? It's like you can't explain it to them ahead of time, but they'll figure it out once they realize the limitations. So the same thing happens with Toby Cosgrove. I've been pitching to use, first they wanted me to use Shibboleth. You know what that is? It's like this thing from 10 years ago, the Internet 2, actually helped develop at OSU in case. I said, no, 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 this thing called OpenID. All right? So I got them at least the line to do OpenID. Now, they're going to have applications in health, energy, safety, education. They're not even mentioning my portal. They're going to have all these things that they're researching. And each of them expect to do a separate login. So the ideal scenario is I'm sitting there, I'm showing that I'll get, I'll, I'll just do single sign-on between their main system and people aggregator. Oh, look, you don't have to log in a second time. And then I go over and so I'm demoing to Toby, and, da -da -da, and oh, now I've got to go log into my clinic. And then Lev turns and says, well, you know, Toby, uh, if you'd allow your programmers to single sign-on and federate, Toby goes, okay, fine. And then the boss finally sees the benefit and the boss lets them do it. And that's the game you play. You got, as smart as we are, we're trying to anticipate what, okay, I'm done. I'm done. He wants me to stop. So thank you very much. Well, I have info here if you want some propaganda or contact information.